The Marvel Studios has audiences excited for the MCU once again with the first trailer for Deadpool and Wolverine and the finally confirmed casting for the Fantastic Four. Hopes are far less high for Sony's legally mandated universe of Marvel characters, aka the SUMC or the SSU. Now that Dakota Johnson is starring as the clairvoyant ambulance driver who must protect the fate of three future Spider-Women known as Madam Web. And who could be surprised at how awful this movie's done with audiences and critics after the past few months of social media jokes from the movie's trailer alone? Whether it's the costumes that look ripped out of a CW show, or Dakota Johnson acting on this movie's press tour like she found out her mom just died in, in the, the Amazon, Amazon while researching, researching spiders. spiders. Take this seriously. It's almost like Sony learned absolutely nothing from the last dreadful Spider-Man spin-off it dropped a few years ago that instead became a legendary meme, with Jared Leto bearing his fangs as the living vampire named Morbius. After both the Venom movies made big box office in spite of poor critical reception, Sony sought to further exploit its agreement with Marvel Studios over using the Spider-Man character by making another Spidey-free spin-off movie for one of Peter Parker's various foes, Dr. Michael Morbius, with Jared Leto thankfully not molding his Joker grills from Suicide Squad into a pair of fangs to play the titular Doctor. But after two long years of COVID-induced delays, in between which was another mega-hit Spider-Man movie from Sony and Marvel that crossed over all the live-action Spider-Verses, Morbius appropriately came out on April Fool's Day to get immediately staked in the heart by critics and fall off from its number one opening at the box office, with all the jokes and memes being made on Twitter at the expense of Morbius' failure accidentally being taken by the Sony executives as a genuine sign of love for the movie. Movie, which merited a theatrical re-release right after the film already released on digital that flopped so badly as to be pulled out of theaters after three days. Three days! But when you strip away all the memes, does Morbius have any genuine merit as a horror-based superhero flick, or is it just another turd in the wind from Sony's half-baked Marvel Universe? And no, Joe Blow viewers, despite Spider-Man's obvious appearance in the background of Morbius' first trailer, none of the live-action Peter Parkers will be appearing in this motion picture. But Michael Keaton as the Vulture will be appearing, as promised, and when we get to discussing his big cameo, oh ho boy, we're gonna get nuts. Come on! Now it's Morbin time to trade in that bag of blood for a box of wine, as we bite into the awfully good drinking game. Take a double shot when we once again see that awkwardly worded opening logo, in association with Marvel, which is just Kevin Feige and Bob Iger's way of saying they heartily endorse this Marvel movie and our streaming series. We open in the jungles of Costa Rica, where a helicopter lands carrying the good doctor himself, who is already dressing like a vampire before actually becoming one. You need a doctor? I am a doctor. Morbius is here to capture some vampire bats from the mouth of this cave to sample them for his scientific experiments, and luring them in by cutting open his hand and doing the same pose that Madame Webb did in that promotional photo. And that is how Dr. Morbius would become known in history as the first man to deliberately sicken himself with rabies and COVID at the same time. We then cut back 25 years prior to the Isles of Greece, where a young Morbius spends his youth behind the windows of a children's hospital due to his rare and fatal blood disease. When the hospital's director and Morbius's adoptive dad, Dr. Emil Nicholas, played by the great Jared Harris, introduces Michael to his soon-to-be foster brother, with whom he shares a blood disease, originally by the name Lucian. My name's Lucian. Hello, Milo. The person who was here before was Milo. But now renamed Milo after the very first sick kid that he shared this room with. That shit seems like something a prisoner would do to make his new cellmate his prison bitch. You look pretty to me. I like white boys. And I kiss you. And it ain't personal with you either because you white. Then Milo soon falls into a coma like he's an audience member of Morbius, and Michael quickly fixes his malfunctioning equipment in a jiffy thanks to the many hours he spent binge-watching MacGyver. There's a school for gifted children in New York. 
No, folks, he does not mean that school for gifted children. Marvel is gonna damn well draw the line at letting Sony use any of the X-Men. They have already got Sir Patrick Stewart ready to keep popping up in that wheelchair for cameos well into his 90s. His brother is left behind to finally confront the bullies outside, who've been taunting the sick kids from outside their hospital window, making these bullies too cartoonishly evil even for a Stephen King novel. <laughs> Ironically enough, Milo would end up breaking that kid's spine with his crutches, thus making him legitimately handicapped for the rest of his life. Morbius grows himself up into a respected blood doctor who's now accepting the Nobel Prize from Dr. Nicholas for his groundbreaking discovery of artificial blue blood. Saved more lives than penicillin. But Morbius refusing the prize much to the chagrin of his scientific partner, Dr. Martine Bancroft, played by Adria Aroda. Front page, American scientist rejects Nobel Prize. I'll just go ahead and ignore that obvious mispronunciation of Nobel, Nobel Prize as we watch Academy Award-winning actor Jared Leto explaining how Morbius plans to extract the DNA of these Costa Rican vampire bats and merge it with his own DNA to form a serum that could quite possibly be the cure he's long been looking for. We have to push the boundaries, take the risks. Pull the string! In fact, he tests the serum out on a mouse who soon ends up doing the Fred Sanford heart attack. Oh, this is a big one! but who Martine finds later to be alive and well, and who in a deleted scene would soon turn into the Marvel Universe's most legendary villain of all, Mousebius. <laughs> who should be funding these experiments but the Doctor's grown brother Milo, now played by a post-Doctor Who and pre-House of the Dragon Matt Smith who's just as eager as his brother to finally be cured of their lifelong blood ailment. We're the original Spartans, mate. The few against the many. We are the few against the many. Just don't ask how his character got rich in the first place because the character development in this film is as non-existent as Matt Smith's eyebrows. Milo sails the two doctors out on a private mercenary vessel in international waters, so Morbius can test the potentially illegal serum on himself, where Jared Leto proves that he can be quite a charming actor even without all of his usual method acting quirks. I read it in Cosmo. Did they still make Cosmo? I don't know. Though he did still go method on the movie set by walking with Morbius's crutches while filming the first half. I'd, I'd never met him, and I've still never really met him as Jared only as Michael. To the point of taking 45 minute bathroom breaks. I'd, I'd never met him. Then after Martine injects the serum into Morbius's frail CGI body, with the film not even bothering with the cool on-screen transformation sequence, we cut to find Morbius out of his chair and dancing on the ceiling like he's Lionel Richie, having finally turned into the living vampire. Now while Morbius's vampire form looked like a cool prosthetic effect in that first trailer, his face is pretty much just a CGI effect in the final movie that looks worse the further away from the camera it is as well as having this smoky trailing effect behind him that looks more like a cross between Pigpen and the Tasmanian Devil. <laughs> and killing off these nameless henchmen in super slow-mo. And no, there's not going to be much blood spilled in this PG-13 movie, a rating that is inexcusable for any vampire movie that isn't being made for children or teenagers, with smoke and blue lighting covering up Morbius's few kills, except for this one hilarious henchman who appears to dance the electric slide for a moment before bleeding to his death. It's electric! Soon Michael wakes back into his human form, now walking perfectly fine and looking perfectly fine with his newly acquired vampire abs. How's he gonna explain this to Ant Morb? And yes, fellow film nerds, this piece of crap really does have the nerve to make a reference to the very first vampire movie ever made, Nosferatu, also about a vampire killing people on a boat from director F.W. Murnau. This is the L.C.V. Murnau. Mm. Say it right! Hell, why not bring in Werner Herzog for a cameo as the captain of the LCV Murnau, with his first mate being played by Robert Eggers? Nosferatu jokes! But just as Morbius' legs start changing into that crazy-legged guy from that old Levi's commercial, he quenches his bloodlust in time with some of his fake blue blood. Yeah, that's good hemoglobin! 
and gets to describing in endless exposition to his tape recorder all the newly acquired powers that he's got, such as echolocation, bat radar for the uninitiated, the ability to visually rip off from Batman Begins, and climbing atop surfaces with the greatest of ease, much like a monkey would do, and not a fucking bat! Yesterday, I could barely walk today. I have the constitution of an Olympic athlete. Jesus, this dialogue sounds like something that Rod Burgundy would scream angrily at his wife. I have the constitution of an Olympic athlete! Ah! But with Morbius's great powers comes a cursed responsibility. Or so he insists to Milo when he comes by to find Michael struggling with his newly vampiric state and now wants to be cured by taking some of the serum for himself. I can't control it! So you get to live and I get to die, is that it? Get out! I said get out! Get out of here, Milo. You don't want no part of this shit. Well, guess that Milo is just gonna have to take that serum off screen and commit himself a murder of this nurse in the hallways of Morbius's hospital. After she failed to change out the fluorescent light bulbs in this hallway like she promised. Oh, thank God you're here, Dr. Acula. Wait a minute. We don't have any Dr. Acula working here. <laughs> but Morbius blames himself for the nurse's death that now grabbed the attention of the two FBI agents who have been on the doctor's trail since his boat massacre. Simon Stroud and Al Rodriguez, played respectively by Tyrese Gibson and Al Madrigal both of whom are useless to this already useless movie. Well, we haven't had anything this good since that thing in San Francisco. Madrigal keeps dropping snarky quips in every other line of dialogue, like he's Cat Dennings from the Thor movies. Apparently they all shop at the same mercenary supply store. Holy water? I'm not taking any chances. While Tyrese looks just as confused as the audience as to why he's even here. First, I want to say thank you. The artificial blood actually saved my arm in Afghanistan, so. Oh, that's right. It's because his character's original big subplot of a high-tech robot arm was all but deleted from the final movie, despite being bragged about already by Tyrese in a 2020 Maxim interview. But even funnier, Tyrese posted, then deleted on Instagram, this fake Twitter quote from Martin Scorsese, praising Morbius as the truest height of cinema and apologizing to all comic book movies thinking that it was genuine praise for Morbius from the actual Martin Scorsese. I can't believe what happened. Oh, neither can we, Tyrese. This is huge! And funniest of all, just wait till you see the terrible audition tape that Tyrese sent in for Scorsese to play the Lily Gladstone part in Killers of the Flower Moon. My baby. At least that April Fool's prank is way funnier than any of the superhero type quips dropped by Jared Leto, with all the uncomfortable energy of James Franco co-hosting the Oscars. I'm starting to get hungry. You don't want to see me when I'm hungry. Well, good to know that the Incredible Hulk does exist in Sony's Marvel Universe. The Hulk TV show from the 70s, that is. Not the actual Hulk. And certainly not any fucking Spider-Man. This movie makes the same mistake as the Venom movies did by trying to remold this villainous character into a sympathetic anti-hero who gives origami to little sick kids in between thirsting on the blood of the living with all those dead guards on the boat established as nobody that we need to worry about. Pretty sure they were guilty of something and happy to have them off the water. And without any Peter Parker for Morbius to face off against here, that only leaves Matt Smith to be revealed as our big villain in this clever nod to the Kaiser Soze reveal from Usual Suspects, having become a living vampire, much like his big adoptive brother. <laughs> and with the newly villainous Milo wanting to get back at humanity for mistreating him in his handicapped state, Let's have some fun. Milo and Morbius get into a rumble down in this London train tunnel trying to pass for a New York subway. And Michael flees from Milo using a superpower that looked way cooler in Sony's latest Spider-Man 2 game. All bullshit, if Jared Leto was an actually committed method actor, then he would insist on jumping in front of that train himself while wearing a wingsuit. Sure, he'd surely be dead, but humanity would be spared any more terrible 30 Seconds to Mars albums. 
but the biggest crime that Morbius commits is being so goddamn boring for so much of its runtime. As not even this dramatic standoff between Morbius and these drug dealers to steal their headquarters for his new secret lair can spice things up a bit, even with yet another jokey reference to the Venom movies. Who the hell are you, Matt? They are Batman. Venom. You can go now. Which yet again is totally different than how that joke was seen in the second trailer. I'm just kidding, it's Dr. Michael Morbius at your service. I will give Tom Hardy this much as Venom. He is giving that performance his all, which makes those movies at least enjoyable for Venom's huge fan base on a can't be bad level. But Jared Leto is taking this role way too seriously, with none of the hammy dramatic flair that Morbius had in the Spider-Man cartoons or comics. Whereas Matt Smith as Milo, on the other hand, well, yes, not since Bully McGuire danced down the street in Spider-Man 3 have we seen such an enjoyably ridiculous dance number within the Spider-Verse, clearly being improvised by Matt Smith to a song that has lyrics about having sex and pooping your pants. God bless you, Matt Smith, for being this movie's greatest savior. He legitimately acts like a recently handicapped person who's finally gained the strength and confidence he's lacked his entire life. Where Jared Leto's performance is like a dried Slim Jim. Tomorrow I'll be forced to consume human blood and I can't do that, I won't do that. Matt Smith digs into this part like a medium rare T-bone steak. Even getting a great scene up against Jared Harris, arguing over his newfound vampire powers, like he was a gay teenager arguing with his homophobic dad. Michael doesn't accept what he is. I'm gonna make him accept it. Michael, the favorite! Oh, don't be childish, Milo! Sadly, that will be the most that Jared Harris gets to do here, before he gets sliced across the belly and stays alive just long enough for Morbius to hear his dying words. It's Morbin time. The doctor concocts an antidote for himself and Milo that will also unfortunately lead to their deaths. Just as Martine gets herself captured by Milo and gets found by Morbius while bleeding to death. Make it mean something. Gee, wonder if that drop of Morbius's blood in her mouth will lead to her coming back as a vampire at the end. Ah well, now we've got to focus on some more CGI vampire brawling between Morbius and Milo, taking place in the same abandoned construction zone that all Spider-Verses have their fight scenes taking place in, all leading up to the dramatic reveal of Morbius's greatest bat power of all. Come to me, jungle friends. Good to see that our hero can't even finish this final fight scene by himself without the help of a horde of CGI bats coming to his rescue and lifting him up in the air in a Jesus pose. Marvel Jesus. What the hell is happening and who the hell cares? Just kill off Matt Smith so he can go start collecting those HBO checks already. Give me my name. I'm sorry. Lucian. Well now with Milo both cured and killed by Morbius, the movie can just sort of putter out to the end of its mercifully short 105 minute running time. Morbius and his new bat friends fly up into the night sky while Tyrese and his partner look confusedly into the distance without thanking him one more time for the artificial blood that Same saved his arm in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. While we find that Martine has, surprise, come back to life as a living vampire herself, providing perhaps the weakest ending tease that I've ever seen in any Marvel-related movie. That is until we see the actual weakest ending tease in Marvel movie history that awaits during our end credits. As a film that stars a former Joker, now gets a cameo from a former Batman. Yeah. As Marvel fans remember, Spider-Man No Way Home came out four months before Morbius, which had Doctor Strange's spell to make the world forget Spider-Man's secret identity backfiring and nearly leading to every villain from every universe who knows Peter Parker materializing through a hole in the sky, along with Tom Hardy's Venom making an end credits cameo to tie the film into the Sony vs. chronology. So to make this movie barely connect with the MCU's chronology, the first of Morbius's end credit teasers opens with that purple hole popping up in the New York sky, followed by Michael Keaton magically popping up in a jail cell back as Adrian Toomes, aka the Vulture, who served as Spider-Man's first big foe in Sony and Marvel's first Spider-Man movie together, Homecoming. 
I thought Keaton was one of the MCU's best villains in that movie, and I was hopeful from his confirmed cameo in that first Morbius trailer that Sony and Marvel Studios had finally gotten their shit together. But that trailer's release in January 2020 was a whole different lifetime ago. And while both trailers had Morbius and Vulture crossing paths outside the jailhouse, the movie just has Vulture leaving jail alone, while a news report hastily explains that the newly appeared prisoner will likely just be let go from custody without his name in any records. Because that's how jail works. Then after another round of credits, which somehow looked more stylish than the actual movie did, we cut to another stinger of Dr. Morbius driving to the outskirts of town to be met by Adrian Toomes now flying in with his vulture suit. Even though the Chitauri technology from the first Avengers he made his suit with does not exist in this universe without any goddamn Avengers in the first place. I'm not sure how I got here. Has to do with Spider-Man, I think. Yes, I agree with the hastily recorded ADR from Michael Keaton. This must have something to do with Spider-Man. A character who has yet to be even established as existing within this parallel MCU. Aside from his interdimensional cameos at the end of Let There Be Carnage and No Way Home. The only reason Michael Keaton was called in here for a day's worth of shooting was that Sony could yet again put out another worthless tease for their Sinister Six movie that they have been trying to get off the ground for 10 years and counting. But I think a bunch of guys like us should team up, could do some good. Intriguing. No, that is not intriguing. You don't even know what a Spider-Man is yet. That shot of Spider-Man's graffiti in the trailer was specifically shot for the trailer without the director's supervision. And what a waste this is of the great Michael Keaton. After he ironically made a career comeback in Birdman playing a once great actor whose career has suffered from making increasingly junky superhero movies. With his slightly less disappointing return as Batman in The Flash not even flaming out in theaters for a whole other year yet and his film cameos for both Batgirl and Aquaman 2 soon getting flushed down David Zaslov's shitter. And even worse, Sony deleted a film cameo with J.K. Simmons, back once again as J. Jonah Jameson, which makes all the Daily Bugle appearances popping up in the film entirely useless. Are you serious? Go straight to hell, Sony. You might as well add a third cameo right after the rest of the credits, where we find Milo dancing on top of Stan Lee's grave, which we find below has Stan the Man's corpse literally rolling over in his coffin. So instead of Morbius popping up in this deleted cameo from the ending of the first Blade movie in 1998, He's instead waited 25 years to get his very own movie. That damn well wasn't worth the wait. It truly does feel like a checklist of all the cliches from a pre-MCU superhero movie in the 2000s, whose greatest loyalty to the original comics is just having some characters appearing from the comics, and whose titular anti-hero is blown off the screen by Matt Smith as the one actor having any fun with this garbage. The only reason Morbius should exist is for all of those hilarious memes, which are now even funnier knowing that the cinematic masterpiece that all these memes claim Morbius to be is largely just a lifeless and joyless cinematic crap heap, representing the very worst of superhero movies. That can't be good at being either a vampire movie or a superhero movie, and proves that Sony should stick to their amazing PS5 games and the incredible Spider-Verse animated movies instead of any further entries across their live-action Spider-Verse. However, the biggest villains of the movie weren't actually Morbius or Milo. It was the screenwriting duo of Matt Sazama and Burke Sharpless. Burke Sharpless whom Sony would retain to write the Madam Web movie. You sure didn't need Raven Simone to help you predict how that was going to turn out. On the enjoyableness continuum scale from Boulder Bruce, Morbius is mostly just a Morbius that will make the audience Snorbius, and Morbs its fangs into a Forbius out of 10. Good luck to you at the box office this year, Craven the Hunter and Venom 3. You're sure as hell gonna need it.
I'm Jesse Shade for JoeBlow.com, and thanks again for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the Joe Blow Originals channel. Tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support. And since Craven is coming on the way this August, I guess I'll have to start changing my clocks for daylight savings to go from Morbin time to Webin time. You're gonna love it. In fact, I think you're gonna see it twice. <laughs> Are you serious? Has anything like this ever happened to you? You wear your favorite shirt and bam, you end up with a stain. I know it's happened to my character Morbius. Today, I'm testing popular methods, stain removal. It's all about the lemon. Lemon is not working. Woo!